At the first service, my voice was barely audible. Um, and I just determined that I got a cold from either my 95-year-old mom or my three-year-old granddaughter who I saw this week. Um, I don't know, but it's good to be back with you. I will tell you a story that my mom shared with me. She went to church with Neil Armstrong, and my grandfather actually confirmed Neil Armstrong into the Christian faith. So he grew up in our tradition, in the United Church of Christ tradition, the German evangelical and reformed tradition. And one of uh, the folks who she met later when she went back to church said, you know, when Neil returned on anniversary Sunday, he had become reclusive. And my mother looked at the person and said, he was not reclusive. I knew him for three years and I never heard the boy say a word. He's an introvert. <laughs> so, so I share that with you today because she was reminding me of stories of her childhood and it was good to hear her talk and come to share some of the dis distant memories. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Only one week removed from all five of our senses being blown away by belief with sound, the sounds of two organs, the timpani and brass, the choir, and the touch of the feast of resurrection joy, which we had real bread and real grape juice for the first time in years. And there it was, the smell of the beautiful Easter flowers, the sight of the cross with white linen cloth upon it and the continued proclamation spoken aloud that Christ is risen indeed. Today, we come from that doubt, face to face with doubt. The Gospel of John's very next scriptural verses following Mary's wonderful and joyful exclamation that she has discovered and encountered her risen teacher, her rabbi, Rabboni in the garden, we meet Thomas doubting that this is true. From the fierce faith, which has run from the empty tomb back to the others to tell them about the great news, we come to empty faith, fiercely declaring, this can't be true. We move into this resurrection season of Easter with these two stories back to back. Because of this passage, Thomas has given a name. What do we call it? Doubting Thomas, right? We all know the name. And I propose that rather calling him Doubting Thomas, we should all look in the mirror and say, that guy reminds me a lot of me. <laughs> in our own doubt, we bring doubt to life. There's no question we have doubt. Moreover, we should look at Thomas, instead of just a doubter, as an early scientist, the one who needs physical proof, of the wild proclamation that the tomb is empty that Jesus is risen from the dead, and that the risen Savior actually visited with the disciples? Really? It is the second week of Easter when Thomas finally sees Jesus face to face. He's been listening to his cohorts go on and on in these days before about Jesus and the risen nature. They'd all seen him and it's just great. So let's give this guy a break. He's been listening to all of them. He hasn't witnessed this. It is only when he finally places his hand in the holes in Jesus' hands, in the holes in his side, that he believes. That's descriptive. And that's what the scripture tells us. He needs to see. Jesus lets him see. Jesus lets him touch the holes hasn't happened with the others as far as we know, right? Then the Savior loves him in that moment, declaring for all who follow all time, blessed are the ones who do not see, and yet they believe. Come, see, believe. As we step into the 50 days of Easter, I've been thinking a lot about Tom and what it means to show up to believe, 
I'm very grateful for all of you, like Thomas, who have come back the week after all of the great declarations, all of the celebrations, the beautiful sounds and spirit of Easter, because it's still Easter and you're still here. Nine days from now, we get a chance to see and believe firsthand, to join with a powerful group of people who are our brothers and sisters in Franklin County, brothers and sisters of faith, to come to see, to believe in the work of justice through bread at the Nehemiah action. Now, some of us here need no physical evidence, no life experience as proof that guns kill people, that our environment is in crisis, that 50,000 people in Columbus need municipal IDs, and that we need more than 54,000 households in Franklin County for folks who need affordable housing. Others of us need all these things, no matter what you tell us. We need pictures. We need personal testimonies. We need spreadsheets. We need numerical evidence. We need somebody doing the research on this. And we need hard facts if we're going to believe these things. We ask a lot of questions, and we make a lot of comments about these things. We need to touch and see for ourselves. We who doubt tend to drive you who are true believers just a bit crazy. Similarly, we who are the true believers drive the doubters just a little bit more than crazy. We hear something that we deem is true and the doubters look at us and go, oh my gosh, they don't have any evidence. What are they doing? and we just go with it. The work of justice always brings together doubters and true believers. That's actually a very true thing. There is a place for each kind of person in the work of bread, building responsibility, equality, and dignity. In nine days, we all get the chance to experience that unity in diversity. And that's what will happen on, or, or, excuse me, on April 25th. Problems in our community are identified and solutions are recommended. Currently, we're working on six issues of problems in the community over a period of years. Ju juvenile justice, municipal IDs, gun violence, which we call stop violence, build trust, elder care, affordable housing, and environmental justice. So I want to introduce you to two of the problems and two of the solutions we're recommending in bread. Now again, we come together as a community of Christians and Jews to solve these problems. It's a huge effort. So we have a problem with affordable housing. We know from research provided by the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio that in our county, there are more than 54,000 households of people spending half or more of their paycheck on housing. This includes renters and homeowners. Owners. It also includes parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles who have stepped up and opened their homes and are raising young relatives with little or no financial support. We know that in 2021, a worker in Franklin County needed to earn $19.83 an hour to afford a two-bedroom apartment. We know that in 2017, the Affordable Housing Alliance projected that meeting the housing needs of the 54,000 low-income families to afford housing would cost $335 million six years ago. We know it's over a billion dollars now. And we know that only 25% of families eligible for rental assistance receive it in our county. That's amazing. The Columbus City Council's tax policy incentive change for affordable housing through tax incentives to developers does not impact the neediest families. We know that. Finally, we know that 18,441 evictions were filed in Franklin County Municipal Court in 2015. Now, that's a ways ago. This compares in the same year with 12,000 in Cleveland 22,000 in New York City. Think about this. New York City, the largest city in the country, had almost the same number of evictions filed as Franklin County. 
Even with the Franklin County Courts limiting evictions in the spring, despite the federal moratorium that happened during COVID, there were still 12,000 evictions in Franklin County during the pandemic. We have solutions in the face of affordable housing crisis. We press the Franklin County commissioners to increase their affordable housing commitment. In 2019, they approved a resolution which would generate $6.5 million of additional funding to affordable housing. That happened because of bread. Columbus is sitting on half a billion dollars that we received through the American Rescue Plan that was allocated two years ago that has not been spent on anything. And we're calling for a third of that to go to the Affordable Housing Trust, targeting families who are below 50% of the area of medium income, which is $30,000 a year. In the city of Columbus, we want to see the same 30% of the American Rescue Plan dollars go to housing solutions, targeting families, again, who are at that same level. We want Columbus to work with us on a housing plan that will require developers to set aside 20% of new housing for households making less than 50% of the area median income. Again, 30,000. All of this can be done. We know that too. And we need all of us to come together to make that happen. This is not just a walk in the park. This is hard work and intentional work. We also know there are problems with our environment, locally, nationally, and globally, Remember the bumper sticker that some of us had years ago said, think globally, act locally? Well, this is the place to do it. Locally, we know that the most severe uh, impact of climate change hit the most vulnerable neighbors the hardest. Certain zip codes are more likely to suffer from the effects of flooding, poor air quality, and increased heat. Through our research, and this is a research-based organization, I'm saying this to Thomas, who is out there listening. Of 60 major U.S. cities, Columbus is the fastest growing of 60 major U.S. cities and the eighth largest urban heat island. Columbus can expect an additional three to seven weeks, prepare yourselves, of 90 degree days by 2050 comes from the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, which is at The Ohio State University. We are getting more and heavier rain, and all of us were aware of what happened in Fort Lauderdale this week with 25 inches of rain that just kept feeding off the Gulf Stream. We have those same kinds of things happening here, and we know it, we feel it, which increases the likelihood of flooding and poses significant risks to infrastructure and public health. The number of days per year that had more than 1.25 inches of rainfall increased by 75% from 1951, when some of us were coming into life and living in this city, to 2012. Columbus is currently ranked the 13th worst place to live in the country, to live with asthma. And days over 90 degrees associated with dangerous ozone pollution levels that trigger asthma attacks, heart attacks, and other serious heart conditions and health conditions. Again, all of this is evidence-based, right? Columbus has less tree coverage than cities of comparable size and development, and 70% of our existing tree canopy is on privately owned land in, this, in the region. Communities like Franklinton, at 15%, Milo Grogan at 16%, and the South Side at 18% are well below the average of the city. Columbus currently lacks any protections for trees on private property and the public property, which means developers can cut down any and all trees without approval, without needing to replant anywhere. Beyond the obvious dangers posed by flooding, health experts have told us that flooding can be a major contribution to issues since mold and dust in moist environment dust mites thrive in, in moist environments <laughs> these dangers are compounded by a lack of regulation on mold in homes as well as the very high cost of remediation 
If you are at income lower than most, you're most likely to live close to highways or industry or other areas of high pollution, have more pavement, less tree coverage. And so you know this even more, that you're triggered with respiratory problems. But we have solutions. Now, when I first heard this solution last year, I need to tell you, Rob, I was like sitting in the room at the Celeste Center going, really? This is the solution to this? But the more I've thought about it, this really is the solution to this. Here it is. We, prote we protect our trees. We protect our trees. That's it. We protect mature trees, particularly. Urban forests are one of the most valuable forms of infrastructure a city can have. That is because trees absorb the stormwater and filter the pollutants from industries and highways. They reduce heat through shade and evaporation. They protect large, to protect large and mature trees is critical because they can literally reduce the summertime ambient air temperature by 20 degrees Fahrenheit, reduce street level air pollution by 60% and absorb hundreds of millions of gallons of stormwater. That comes from the Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan from the city, right? The cooling effect of one healthy tree is equivalent to 10 room-sized air conditioners operating 20 hours a day. The shade of properly placed trees can save homeowners up to 58% on daytime air conditioning costs, while mobile homeowners can save up to 65%. New York City made a decision years ago, and they, they saw a significant decrease of asthma in young children, uh, minus 29%, after increasing their tree canopy by planting 300 trees for each square kilometer. If you're curious what the tree canopy coverage is like in your neighborhood, you can look this up. I'll give you the, the link if you want it. At the 2020 Nehemiah Action, we asked city officials the following key questions. Will you commit to ensure that this plan, the Urban Forestry Master Plan, is implemented with fidelity? Will you commit to ensuring the public tree ordinance is introduced to City Council no later than February 1, 2023? And will you commit to having a consultant to develop a private tree protection ordinance no later than June 1, 2023? They said yes to everything that we asked. They said yes to meeting with us. And these things have yet to be implemented. But we keep working on it. We have it in a draft form, and it's moving ahead. You see, that's how it works. It's not simple, but it does take a plan. And we are the only group in the city and the region as people of faith who've come together to say this, to demand this co collectively. We still have a lot to do with this to make sure our solutions work. It cannot work if we do not show up in large numbers to make things happen. Our power is not in money, our power is in people. So I invite you, I implore you to come Tuesday night, April 25th for bread. Together with several thousand other Ohioan people of faith, Jewish and Christian, black, white, brown, and more, young and old, rich and poor, we are bread. It is you and me. Moreover, it is all of us together working for solutions to injustice in our community. Just as Lent served for us as a season of giving up things, letting go and letting God in our lives, of forgiveness, let's all approach the Easter season with the sense of urgency and spirituality that Jesus, the risen Christ, did. It is a season of action. That's what Jesus does all through Easter season before he ascends to God. He's in action. Lent is a time to see the problems that we work on personally. This is the time to see the problems that we work on as a society and a group together. Last word, before I lose my voice, <laughs> last word on doubt. Too many of us doubt these things can actually happen, that anyone's actually going to make it happen, that any of us can change these injustices. And I need to tell you, just like Jesus told Thomas, your doubt is wrong. We can do this. I have been a witness 
to things changing in this community because of bread over these 24 years. I've seen it. So if you have these doubts, it might be doubts about bread. It might be doubts about justice. It might be doubts about things. Don't, don't give in to that. Instead, follow your spirit of moving toward this action plan in these two areas. Come see and believe. Let us set aside the, the doubters in us. Let us set aside the doubt, the true believers. Let us set aside even all the true belief. Just come together because together we make the change. On the 25th of April, we will have top flight child care programming for all the children who need a place to get a break. But we start at 645 and anyone who's ever been to the Celeste Center and been to a bread action knows we are out on time, which you're gonna say is not gonna be true for worship this morning if he doesn't stop. We start on time, we end on time. We have lots of things for you to wear, T-shirts included. And I want to thank the bread team for your work to bring us all together. This is our first time together in person only since 2019. So let's do this. Let's come see and believe. You will be part of the largest faith justice action in Ohio, in Ohio, in 2023. So don't miss it. Thanks be to God for solutions to our community's problems. And may bread always rise. Amen.